be uh, a few presentations with some slides and then we're, we're gonna save some time at the end for some Q and A. And um, I will let our speakers introduce themselves and they're gonna be sharing some slides. Um, but if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put um, your questions in the chat or save them um, for the end of the presentation. So it's good to see you all. I'll pass it over to Karina. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I sure will. Hi, everybody. I'm Karina Kagura Kramer. I'm coming to you from Arctic Alaska in Kotzebue, where uh, the Neelik Association is. Can everybody hear me okay? Our internet is, is blowing me away, but I'm going to turn my camera around because I'm this is my view today. This is the Arctic Ocean, and everybody loves to see that. So uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day up here. Is that Shantia? All right. So Hello. Sorry, someone right needs to be on mute. There you go. Okay, so anyway, I'm Karina Kramer. I live in Kotzebue. I'm Inupak. My family is from Norvik and Kotzebue, Alaska. And um, I began working with Maniluk and kind of health stuff a good number of years ago with Lucas, um, starting off just kind of as a community uh, bouncing board, I guess you could say, and began to directly work with him on some of the health initiatives that we have here in the Arctic. Um, I am gonna start off with a pondering question that I will end at um, my end of my little uh, presentation. So I have three hints, three tips to guarantee that you will get patient engagement with indigenous people in your like, uh, when you have like an appointment with them. I, I don't know if you're all docs, medical docs, but. Um, this is some of the things that I do for, um, I did for Manilak and I do now currently with um, various um, community partnerships and research and academics. So I work, um, my sister and I have uh, uh, co-founded a business called Respectful Research. You can find us online. And we uh, are creating courses to help people do these sort of partnerships. So I wanna make sure that, um, you know, the people that work with our people or indigenous people really understand the best methods and equitable ways and uh, best practice in uh, helping serve our people. So um, I'm gonna start off with a little slideshow that I started and I wanted to make it really fun. Um, so, but I didn't have time because we're, we're doing, we did a, a course intensive just ended yesterday. And uh, so I'm gonna screen share. Um, welcome everybody. So, okay. I would love to know all your discipline, but we don't have enough time. So let me screen share here. <clears throat> okay, let me see. Okay, can everybody see this screen? I am going right in from my Canva. So this was a talk that I used to do with Lucas long ago and I lost the slides. So now I'm excited to kind of get them back and play with it a little bit and have fun. So um, I, I wanted to show you where we're from uh, and what our people are about. So here we're from the Nana region, Northwest Alaska. And uh, we've it's a very isolated place. As you can see, there are no road systems. 3,800, 38,000 square miles. And any of you who are from Indiana, we got you. So we have 11 villages in our region that we serve, 11 plus villages, 11 villages plus the uh, village of Point Hope, which is actually from another um, region. And the Inupate up here have survived and thrived on the harshest, harshest of lands for thousands of years. We figured things out, folks. Um, to come up here uh, from the outside and try to think about all the different things um, that were brought from the Western world, well, we already figured it out. So you see things like language, sustenance, community, and all of the things that were listed there. And now we look at our value system called Inupé Le Crusade. Thinking about these different aspects, there are 17 
values that we have identified, um, that our elders have identified, uh, gosh, decades ago, and they wanted to codify them and have it be sort of the um, the rules for, for living that have been developed for thousands of years, uh, living together in harmony and not just surviving, but thriving in the Arctic. So you can see all of these things. And usually when I talk to docs or people from outside, I'll ask them to take a look at these and what think about what are the most challenging things you might have in your practice to be able to um, implement uh, these these um, characteristics or things into your daily work, um, because that can be hard to do, but that's something that when you're working with people in rural communities, whether it be Arctic indigenous um, or even down South on the road system, or even just in rural areas like uh, in the mountains of Appalachia, um, you, you'll have um, a sort of set of rules that the people there have discovered that help them live in harmony. So let's wait for that slide to, I had to pause it because I wanted to make sure I didn't run out of time. Oops, sorry. Okay, now we're going to the cool part. Oh crap. Oh no, what did I do? I was so excited about this. Let me see. Okay, well, we can see this. So as you can see, Westerners arrived to the Northwest Arctic just before the turn of the 19th century. And that's really like, that. that's basically like yesterday when it comes to, um, you know, the cultural colonization and westernization that have happened with our people here. Um, and by the 1950s, there was a rapid increasing influx of military, tourists, uh, re teachers, medical professionals, all to kind of help live through, um, help live, uh, you know, day to day. We had a military base that was installed here in the, probably in the 40s. And it was very different because they brought these unfamiliar ways, but also we've learned uh, that we needed to prioritize these ways as like the new value system, the new way to do things, whether it be business or all of these other things. So that was um, that was something that I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop share because this ain't working. Okay. So um, to, just to think about the context, um, uh, it's important to know that there has been a division, I call it the great divide, between communication when you bring these values into a place that is rural and people are used to living in this way for so long and then you bring in a new way, there's gonna be you know, a division or kind of a chasm almost and, and that's what it seemed to be like here. Um, so how do we bridge that? How do we make sure that, um, there, that, the, that the best of your intention as healthcare workers and the best of our intention as, as uh, community members and thinking about the health of our people, how do we make it so that we're working together? Because that's where we feel like there's a disruption. Um, the engagement is not there with patients, things like that. Um, and uh, part of it is uh, that we have to think about the different systems that we've created, You know, all the systems that I mentioned um, and how to kind of marry the two values and the systems together in a healthy way. So that brings us to the needs assessment study that Lucas and I started, uh, gosh, how many years ago now? Six, seven, eight years, I don't know. But um, so I worked on this research project with Lucas and a couple of other people where we went to the villages that, that we saw there and we talked to the community members and we asked them what they hoped for in their healthcare and what, what they felt like is missing, uh, you know, what, what are the things that um, was it, were important to them, especially in the way of um, maintaining who they were as Inubate and not having to think about us transitioning fully over to a westernization because you really can't do that up here in the Northwest Arctic. I mean, 
we can't go back to dog sleds fully, right? <laughs> but we also are very geographically isolated and we don't have access. We, we just don't have access to things that people everywhere else or in many other um, connected places do. Um, so we began to think about the study and a few things came out of it. And then we began, to, Lucas and I began to develop um, this, what we call the social medicine program within the Manilik Association. And there were a few things that, um, that were kind of like the, um, the programs that uh, came out of that. One was like an integrated health idea because there was, a, um, you know, it was very hard for our people who we kind of taught the nation in a lot of disparities, um, especially mental health and, and abuses. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that there was a warm handoff happening within the clinic. So um, we began to look at uh, getting behavioral health people into right into the clinic themselves and not having to wait for a behavioral health program. You know, sometimes you have to wait six weeks. Sometimes you have to do an assessment, you know, all of that. So we really wanted to say in your, and many of you have already uh, uh, experienced this in your um, work probably, but we hadn't yet here. And so being able to come in for a bad knee or an earache and then saying, would you, you know, do you have any issues that you need to talk with? And we had um, people, counselors ready um, on site to bring them in uh, to, um, to talk to immediately. And there were no restrictions as far as, you know, typically a behavioral health session might be like a 45 minute one-on-one -on -one session with tons of notes and tons of different things that you have to comply with basically. And there were no real rules about it. And guess what? There was no cost to it. Um, we we're lo lovely uh, participants and recipients of the um, IHS healthcare system. Um, so there, for us, we're like, whoopie doo, what's the big deal? Well, for the hospital itself and being able to afford um, the different things that we needed, um, we were able to make this make sense because bringing care to people is gonna cost the hospital money. So we had to figure out some other way to bring in the, the uh, revenue. Um, and we'll talk about that. Actually, Lucas will talk about that maybe a little bit later. So the other thing too is thinking about, um, so integrated health being like a behavioral health side, um, the community, and this is where I came in and I was like, we have to like think about our traditional ways of, of uh, our traditional methods of caring for each other and, and then there's the Western ways of caring for each other and all the different things that that comes with. Both, both have, right, some really, really good things about them. And how do we put those together to make it make sense and make it more um, engaging for us? Like we want to go to this. We, so a behavioral health session won't be a one-on-one -on -one with a uh, you know, master's level therapist in a room for 45 minutes with notes and all of the regulations, right? It would look like a community, um, someone who's been, you know, basically trained in uh, kind of lay practitioner care, cutting fish on the beach or sitting around my table, cutting caribou and talking with each other and having this community, sense of community and safeness around familiar familiar um, experiences and really getting down to the nitty gritty, especially when it comes to basic level of care, you know, basic level. I mean, I'm not gonna sit there with someone who's got like clinical bipolar, you know, whatever, because that's, um, that's you really need somebody trained for that. But if somebody is depressed or, you know, all of the things that you can do, there's a real beautiful harmony that can happen between the two um, uh, ways of caring for each other. And, um, and so that was part of my job is to figure that out and bring that to the powers that be to, to adopt. Um, and then there was a training ground for docs, which is where y'all come in. Okay, so that people who care about rural health, people who care about, um, being able to help people in marginalized places um, that don't have the access, the normal access, whether it be financially, 
um, whether it be even just understanding the communication of understanding each other. Um, so, and Lucas will talk about that a little bit later with same it, I gave a plug to same it. <clears throat> um, all this to say, this is a really amazing place to learn rural health um, because it's very unique. Um, and there are so many um, experiences I think that you would have here uh, rather than uh, like, especially on the road system or anything like that. It's just really a cool place to, to be and learn. So um, now I'm gonna move a little bit because uh, Chintia is gonna be talking about subsistence foods in her project. So I wanted to bring through, bring the idea of um, why, you know how they say uh, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. <laughs> we love you docs, but we wanna stay healthy, right? So my argument is that not just an apple, but the subsistence foods off the land that we consume here have are just so amazing. And I, I think that they are the cure. Uh, for many of the ailments that we suffer from, uh, um, even regionally, even as a people up here that we typically suffer from uh, at higher rates than other areas. So one reason, of course, is because for physical health, right? We have the most jam-packed nutrient rich foods ever. Like one cup of our, one of our berries is, has the same amount of vitamin C as eight oranges or our seal meat. It's just so iron. It's so iron uh, thick that it actually, we call it black meat because it, when we dry it, it's like black. It's so iron rich and everybody loves it. Right. But the other physical thing that helps us with our physical health is gathering, right? So we're busy out there. We're, oh my gosh, I couldn't even begin to tell you how much uh, physical, <laughs> physical uh, you need to get out there and even just to pick berries, cut wood, put away fish, um, do all of the things to gather um, the foods that we need throughout the year. Um, but also think about our mental health. That's another aspect of um, this thing about subsistence foods. Um, mental health, I always say the two things, Lucas has heard this for years, the two things that we need for our youth are identity and purpose for their mental health because they're lost. They are depressed. They have no like anchor really because they haven't been exposed as much to the culture and the ways of life as, um, as their older generations. And so bringing them to a connection to their identity um, and also in a personal level with other people. Like I said, cutting fish on the beach or sitting around my table to, um, cutting caribou um, really gets that conversation going in that communal sense that we all are, are used to having as a people. So, um, and it also helps flesh out our responsibility to tribe, which connects our purpose. Like when my son, who's 16, a hunter, brings food to elders in the community, he has a sense of purpose. And so what a beautiful way to help with things like mental health and not really having a connection to others and being lonely and, and not having a purpose. And one more thing as far as um, spiritual or, um, subsistence, the spirituality side, the spiritual health. And oftentimes we don't talk about this when it comes to medicine, but for indigenous people, you know, it, it is a wholeness that we that that's missing. It's kind of a gap in our health care that's missing. And um, indigenous people do have a connection, a spiritual connection with the land and um, our indigenous ways of life. So I don't know how much time. Am I out of time, Lucas? You do you. We're at four. Okay, I do mean. Okay. So I'm down to the three things that guarantee that you will have engagement with your patients in indigenous communities. One is to study the people. And I always say, how many things did you have to study to get to where you are today? How many, how many sort of like networks of people did you have to go to? How many you know, different things did you have to do 
uh, gosh, I hear about residency. Oh my gosh, I only see it on Grey's Anatomy, so I really don't know the reality of it all. But, um, but I know it's pretty daunting. So think about all of the things that you've had to do um, to get to do and study to get to where you are today, right? Now, please let hear if you hear anything. Study the people that you're going to be working with in rural health. And I don't care where the heck it is, right? But you need to put that same amount of eagerness to learn about the people because we know if you're just here for a job. We know if you're just here for, um, you know, your own learning or even if you're here to help people, but you don't take that time to study and know who we are, what kind of values we have, our communication styles, our learning styles, all of those different things are really important to us. And, and it, it just says so much more if you take that time to, to learn. Number two is be engaged with the people. So if you want engagement with patients, you have to be willing to engage with the, the people. And many indigenous communities, and medicine does not like to hear this, or academics, we get personal folks. We wanna know if your name is Billy, not Dr. So-and-so, right? We wanna know if um, you grew up with four dogs on a farm, or if you have children, or if whatever, you fill in the blank. If you can dunk a basketball, you're golden here. I'm just saying. So, but we want to know these things. We want to know, and it's, I've had doctors say to me as a patient um, and me being in this world where I'm like kind of bridging the two, um, one doc was coming up and he was going to check out my knees like a, from Anchorage specialist. And, but he also knew my husband in another capacity. And he was like, contacted my husband going, hey, I'm going to come up, let's have dinner or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, um, well, I, I think I see you on Monday, you know, for an appointment. And the dude was like, well, you should, okay, I don't really do that. Like, I don't have dinner with somebody and then have them be my patient. And, and I actually got kind of mad. I was like, who do you think you are? Like, honestly, and that's the reality of having um, having kind of bridging over this um, personal and doctor relationship um, and being able to, because we live in the Arctic, we live in rural communities, we need each other. And when you're a doc and you're up in the Arctic and you're sitting in, you know, kind of in your own setting and you're busy and whatever, you know, you need that connection with community just as much as we need you in, in your setting. So I would just say, you know, go to our basketball games, um, be a part of digging a grave if you have time, uh, meet somebody at the post office line, you know, something like that. And don't be afraid because we, we bridge over here. Like I have many, many, many doctor friends that I take fishing or, you know, whatever it is. And it's, uh, it really helps break that barrier down or bridge across that, um, that uh, chasm that of, of disruption. And the very last thing I'll say as I take my last deep breath is um, ask about subsistence. Uh, what do the people care about? Here we care about subsistence. Right now we're looking out at this beautiful thing and, and my son looks out every day and he wonders, I wonder if the she fish are, you know, he'll take his auger out there and put his hook in the water. And uh, any minute now the she fish are coming and they're like this big. And I, when I say that, I'm not even just telling you a tale. It's not a fishing tale, it's true. But, um, but it's those, those are the things we care about. So if it's berry season, as soon as your patient comes in there, you know, hey, I'm doctors or so-and-so, whatever. Uh, how's it going? Have you gotten out to pick any berries lately? That will break down a wall like you wouldn't believe. So those are the three things. And I will pass my time on to Lucas. Thank you, Karina. Um, yeah, so I'm Lucas. Um, like 
Karina mentioned, we um, worked on starting a couple of programs together in Alaska, the community-based program, social medicine, and then the Center for Global Health Delivery program, same it. Um, and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at HMS. Um, I'm gonna share some slides here. You see okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so I wanted to share a success story about social medicine in the Indian Health Service and the Alaska Tribal Health System, which those success stories often don't get told. Um, picking up right around where Karina left off on the colonization story. So um, I won't go back into what Karina was discussing, except to say that one of the things that came with colonization was a tremendous amount of infectious disease, um, tuberculosis in particular, became the leading cause of death in rural Alaska among Alaska natives for a couple few decades. Um, and uh, so I wanted to share two sides to the response, um, one of which failed, one of which succeeded um, for reasons very much related to social medicine. Um, so initially, uh, infectious disease control was used as both a pretext for colonization and was to a large extent caused by a colonization. So the rationale for the establishment of a lot of the health and human services infrastructure was infectious disease prevention and control at the same time that it was being introduced and spread by the people settling Northwest Alaska at the sites of these mission schools in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so there were multiple waves of healthcare infrastructure rollout um, from the early days of extremely limited infrastructure and a heavy focus on um, prevention and disease control to the beginnings of the Indian Health Service, when uh, health services were directly administered by the federal government, um, and then on to the Alaska Tribal Health System. Um, but important to know is that by 1950, the life expectancy among rural Alaska Natives was 46, with infectious disease killing about half of all people. Um, Initially, the response to this was pretty heavy handed and more or less what you would expect. It involved uh, commissioning decommissioned naval vessels to evacuate patients to sanatoria in southern Alaska, even as far away as Seattle some of the time. Um, often patients would just never be heard from again. Um, people were essentially disappeared to go die. Um, in these urban care centers. Um, unsurprisingly, this went over extraordinarily poorly um, for the same people that settled the region to be the ones taking your relatives away. Um, it was obviously not a good model for healthcare delivery. Uh, and so taking note of a lot of that resistance, uh, an alternative program came into place by the late fifties um, that was uh, an accompaniment model ambulatory tuberculosis chemotherapy program might have been the first example of directly observed therapy for TB ever that was staffed by community volunteers partnered with field nurses um, helping folks with uh, their medicines. This then became the foundation for the community health aid program um, which still today serves about 178, 180 villages across rural Alaska um, and became the backbone of the Alaska tribal health system um, with life expectancy among Alaska natives uh, up by uh, two decades um, by 1980. Uh, the lady on the left-hand side there is Della Keats who was a chap in the region um, and it was very much somebody 
embodying Karina's description of like straddling that divide of delivering biomedicine and traditional care. Um, so this community health worker program became the basis for the Alaska tribal health system, which today is this huge hub and spoke model that connects village clinics who are staffed by these community health workers. So CHAPS and their counterparts in dentistry and behavioral health. So dental health aid technicians and behavioral health aides. Those clinics are connected to regional hub hospitals that include primary care and reproductive health services, uh, inpatient wards and emergency departments. And then there's one big tertiary care center in Anchorage. Uh, All together, the system serves 228 uh, tribes uh, across Alaska and around 238,000 beneficiaries. So since then, um, having brought infectious disease under control, um, there have been two parallel trends that I think are worthy of thinking about together. One is this movement from infectious disease being the leading cause of death to other kinds of socially determined mortality and morbidity that Carino alluded to. Um, Things from the macro level, a lot of intergenerational trauma and social suffering as a result of displacement to boarding schools and the like intergenerational impacts of infectious disease, um, as well as more approximate social determinants, um, like Karina was mentioning, access to food is a big one. Um, The other trend is the movement from direct Indian Health Service administration of healthcare to compacting for tribal health. And so uh, one of the outcomes of Alaska Natives suing for land back back in the 70s is this direct tribal administration of health services where tribes can take money from the federal government for administration of their own health services. This is how pretty much all of Alaska runs now, and increasingly there are movements down states for tribes to compact, meaning to assume ownership of health services or to contract for specific service lines. So for instance, a lot of folks are taking over behavioral health services to deliver care in a way that's more grounded in community and responsive to local context. Um, And my argument here is that when you combine this transition to more socially determined health disparities and you have a relatively sovereign health system that is responsive to community priorities and values and need, then you can do social medicine. So I think a a very uh, direct and unsophisticated understanding of social medicine is helpful here. I break it into just the two component parts of understanding the social forces that shape health and then delivering care that attends to those forces. Um, That's pretty different than just addressing social determinants of health. Um, I think that really pops out in the tuberculosis care example, where um, the innovations needed were, one, developing drugs that worked and moving them to communities, and two, figuring out a way to actually build a care delivery system um, that was acceptable to its beneficiaries, that was effective in that community context, Um, that made up some ground for past harms done um, and was sustainable over time. Um, So it's not to say that there's no role for biomedicine. It's not to say um, that those care systems should be deprioritized. It's more to say that there are ways to find the common ground between the two and to build systems that actually work for people in their communities. A joke I often hear in the region and elsewhere uh, for folks learning about social medicine is that isn't this just what nurses do? And I think there's some truth to that. In Alaska, I would also say this is what CHAPS do, what community health aides do. Um, I think doctors are a little bit late to the party in terms of prioritizing um, this approach to healthcare. 
Um, but increasingly, I do think people are catching on. Um, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for the subsistence discussion. Um, yeah, let's leave it there. If you do have more um, questions or want to learn more about the programs in Alaska, um, Manilik, Samit websites are there. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, but Chinsia, let's turn it over to you for um, sort of a contemporary example of social medicine and practice. Great. Um, so let's see. I might have to I might have to switch swap displays. Is this um good? Can you guys see like not yes. the that looks great. Um, great. Um, so I'll um, be presenting um, on the project that Lucas and I have been working on. Um, so just to give a quick introduction, um, I'm a current um, fourth year, uh, uh, sixth year MD PhD student. So fourth year, my PhD, hopefully I'm defending soon in a, a couple weeks. Um, and then going back to M3 of my um, medical school training. And the way I kind of got connected to Lucas was that um, at the start of the pandemic, I actually was in Anchorage, Alaska for a little bit. Um, and then um, for this independent study course, um, we were asked to do some sort of um, um, project. And then that's um, when I reached out to someone in the region, and that was Lucas. And I've been working with um, him and other folks at Manilik for about three years now um, on uh, learning more about um, one, the subsistence foods program um, at long-term care, the nursing um, home at Manilik, um, as well as just an overall um, project that we started that we got um, a Harvard IRB approval to um, study subsistence in the region um, in more in general. So I wanted to thank Val and Cyrus for providing me with all the um, stories that I have in my presentation. Um, and I just wanted to kind of jump in to say um, those of you who um, work in healthcare in Massachusetts, or I don't know where this photo is taken, it's from BuzzFeed, um, but this is what you might anticipate to see when you're thinking about meals um, in the Boston area for one of the patients. Um, and this is likely what um, hospital meals look like in the U.S., um, if we look at other places around the world, in Paris, you might have a fancy baguette. Um, uh, but in um, uh, other countries across the world, for instance, in Indonesia or other Asian countries, um, for, for instance, rice is such a um, staple of the um, uh, of a meal that like, for instance, when my family members come to the U.S., that it's really hard for them to eat any Western diet. And imagine being in the hospital where um, your only source of food is something that you're really not used to. Um, having on a um, daily basis. So I just kind of wanted to show these examples of um, diverse uh, types of uh, diets for people around the world in contrast to what um, patients generally have um, within the U.S. And then for um, folks from Northwest Alaska, like Karina had mentioned, um, there is a very different um, um, diet that is followed and a lot of it comes from directly from the land or from the oceans or um, from hunting um, and this is just um, a, um, a photo that I found that kind of showed showcases some of the um, uh, staples of the north uh, northwest Alaskan diet um, and then here um, shows a little bit uh, of um, what kind of um, animals and subsistence practices are used um, within the circumpolar north. Um, and then I wanted to also quickly just review um, subsistence in Alaska. As Karina said, it has um, this practice has persisted over many, many years. I, I found one source that said the past 10,000 years um, with um, the 19th century being still mainly subsistence fishing and hunting. But as we enter the 21st century, there started this development of two different systems, one of more industrial capitalism and ur ur urban settings. So if anyone has been to Anchorage, you know, there's Costco there. Um, there's a lot of um, Western um, sources of getting your Western diet there. Um, but in a lot of rural uh, areas, for instance, Northwest Alaska, um, where Krina is from and Lucas works, um, it's a lot more difficult to get some of these um, 
uh, standard Western foods. So there's still a big reliance on subsistence um, going into um, for hunting and as Karina said, for a variety of the benefits um, that hold there. So for this subsistence foods um, program, um, what I wanted to highlight is actually how this is kind of a um, example of how, how social medicine at work. Um, the details are not as uh, important than rather that with the right um, uh, motivate, motivators and the right conditions, um, it is possible to actually serve subsistence foods in a clinical setting, which um, for us who work in, um, are familiar with the Boston hospital system, um, it's unthink of <laughs> to be able to actually have ethnic um, foods um, for patients who, ask, who would very much appreciate it. Um, so this program actually started um, with the Older Americans Act and which it was enacted in 1965, but this one part of that act specifically um, allows grants for supporting nutrition services to um, elder Native Americans. Um, and then because there is a history of subsistence in the region, um, there was a um, decision that was made um, that these funds shouldn't be used towards the purchase of um, foods for a Western, um, typical Western diet. So in 1993, the subsistence foods program at long-term care was started. And here's an um, image um, that was sent to me uh, that I got from Val, um, where um, you see um, potentially what one of those subsistence meals would, were, would be served to one of the elders at the nursing home. Um, and for, um, so Lucas and Karina already kind of um, discussed the topology Apology of um, where in Alaska we're talking about. So um, we're talking about Northwest um, Alaska, and this is the um, region uh, of which Manilik um, operates. And then this is just a picture of what Kotzebue, um, where, where, which is where Manilik is located, looks like um, from afar. So you can see that it's actually um, hard to get to um, via um, car. And so it's not very easy to um, uh, get food shipped from uh, other regions. Um, so because there was this um, uh, not wanting to break with traditional um, values and and uh, and um, uh, usage of um, traditional foods, so there were some creative avenues for which they decided to put the funds into. So funds were actually initially channeled towards um, what subsistence hunters would use um, to be able to hunt for um, foods. Um, and then um, some of the details were also, um, I wanted to highlight that for all the decisions that were made, um, when I talked about and Cyrus, it seemed um, that all the tribes in the region and in this whole um, Northwest Arctic borough region were um, uh, contacted uh, with their input. So for instance, um, the borough is roughly the size of Indiana, um, but there's no connecting roads to the rest of Alaska. Um, so it was decided with um, a general um, um, meeting of representatives from all the 12 villages that um, uh, working together, they would give fair contributions based on the size of the villages. So I, I want to just highlight that this wasn't something that was made by one administrator at the head of this project, right? It was um, uh, looking into um, what the community wanted and what the community needed. Um, so there were a couple of um, iterations of the project. It started in 1993, but then 1995 allowed for some uh, federal shutdown. Um, in 1995, then there was a transition um, to state funding um, due to one of the administrators going to ask for um, aid from the Alaska Senator. So um, I want to highlight this to medical students as well, because even as a medical personnel or administrator, um, you have the ability to um, change policy. So so if anyone's not um, involved, I'm actually involved in the um, American Medical Association um, and Massachusetts Medical Society chapter here at HMS. So, um, and we're going in early March to um, Capitol Hill to talk to some Congress people. So um, there are ways, and, and the ways that these policies have evolved, have involved both federal and state uh, legislation. So just wanted to highlight that in my discussion of this as well. Um, and then finally, the third iteration came um, in 2014, which allowed for donations of um, subsistence foods to the um, elder long-term care. Um, and so ac accepting these 
donations. Um, like Karina said, um, there's a variety of different foods, dried fish, um, seal oil, black meat, which is seal meat, um, whole duck. And um, it was mentioned that seniors at these facilities will actually participate in these uh, in the processing activities. So someone could bring in um, um, caribou or moose or whole duck, and then the social activity of that day would be people sitting down together and processing um, the foods. And at that time, close to everyone was eating subsistence foods almost seven days a week. And then there will be a state inspector that came in regularly, and it seemed that there was a lot of support for the program. So when there was a renovation, of the um, old senior center now that the building is under federal um, law, um, again, uh, um, they were not allowed to serve subsistence foods because these foods were not USDA approved. Um, and then there were stories from the nurses talking about how the elders were not, uh, were feeling poorly and were just not um, feeling to their old selves and not um, doing really well when they were um, fed on the Western diet of beef and chicken. And here on the right, I have some photos of um, just um, how this, um, the making of seal oil in the traditional way, this is um, Cyrus in the field to um, transitioning to one of the facilities on site and trying to make it there. So um, a long story short, um, um, the long-term care at Menelik became the first facility to obtain USDA approval. And it was due to the fact that um, the Elders not being able to have traditional foods deeply bothered everyone who was uh, working there. And then um, a lot of energy was put into having conversations with the USDA and the Alaskan Department of Environmental Conservation, um, after which um, the decision making power um, to serve these subsistence foods was given to the Millic um, Association. So um, some of the further studies that um, they've worked on and with great su success is um, getting certain uh, foods that traditionally have been you know, eaten within the indigenous population without any testing, um, but to serve seal oil in the nursing home, there had to be some way to prove that there was no botulism um, in the seal oil. And um, the administrators teamed with some of the um, researchers at the University of Wisconsin to be able to um, do those tests. And then currently, um, Luke's and I were working on the traditional subsistence foods and practices as a form of care in Northwest Alaska project just to collect some more stories and um, get a sense of why subsistence foods has been um, so great for us. Um, so what do we learn from this? So um, I want to just highlight a couple of the things. Um, one is that um, because there was already a really strong presence in the area for traditional foods, it was a piece, it was a part of life um, that just because the building was under federal um, um, regulation versus state regulations, it the only thing that really mattered was just having a permit and there was just a piece of paper. Um, it, it, nothing changed other than just those regulations and changing the legal ways that the building was functioning. And then secondly, the long-term care residents and community members were not used to the Western diet. And, and it was clear that it led to a detriment to their well-being and um, and physical, physical and mental well-being. Um, and on top of that, there was a workforce of people who were tirelessly working towards reinstating these traditional foods, as well as um, sympathetic local and state legislators. Um, so like I said before, um, with all these um, uh, factors in play, we were able to, um, or um, Val and Cyrus, as well as others at Manilic, were able to reinstate the um, uh, subsistence foods program um, uh, for the elders at the nursing home. But um, just wanted to show this as a example of how if the will is there, if people are saying, oh, we've done this for generations, why can't we continue doing this? Like what um, happened here, then there's a way to do that. So I just wanted to give some um, hope <laughs> to um, people working currently and thinking that things should be different than they are, that um, there is a way. Um, um, and then you have everyone um, is currently interested in working with um, Lucas and I on this project. This is the title of the protocol that we have. We have our um, few aims to study um, subsistence foods um, in, in both in terms of the long-term care facility as well as just overall um, culturally. And then also we wanted, we we're interested in studying the metabolic and health effects as well, um, which uh, Karina alluded to um, as well as some of the questions. But um, yeah, uh, if anyone's interested, please feel free to 
email me and Lucas, and then I, I put up um, a couple of the links that we had uh, mentioned. Um, Karina's wearing the um, Samet sweatshirt, and uh, this is where some of the information regarding the hunting um, facilities, and here's my email if anyone wants to email me, and this is a, a photo of me when I was in Anchorage. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Um, so I think we'll just open it up for some general Q&A. Um, oh, and Karina put in um, her email as well. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I yes, can hear you now. Um, yeah, I had a question. So on, you mentioned that there was some like reticence to using some of the funding for like non-food items such as gasoline and things like that. Like what were those arguments and how easy or challenging were they to overcome? Oh yeah, um, thanks for the question. I don't know, I don't know if Karina Lucas have... Um, answers to this, but just from me talking to Val and Cyrus, I might have, uh, the wording in my slides might have been incorrect, but I think it was more that there was um, reticence within the indigenous community towards using foods just for things that were deemed um, okay via the Western diet, but rather because um, of people not wanting to do that, there was the agreement to use them towards something else. Um, such as uh, oil and um, I don't know if there's anything like also like gunpowder. I'm not sure if that was included, but um, instead of uh, instead of um, towards foods, but towards um, ways of allowing people to have access to subsistence. I can uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, there's always that hesitation from the community on doing research. Um, just because there have been a lot of um, negative things that have happened uh, over the decades of uh, researchers coming up. And that's one of the things that I'm working on. But um, when it comes to subsistence foods, obviously we just don't want to be stopped in eating them, you know? And so like sharing about, also we have this weird thing where it's not really weird. We're very sharing people, but um, if you have a berry spot, they almost blindfold you if you're going to bring, if they're going to bring you there, because we don't want to give away our secrets. <laughs> so um, when it comes to, you know, I'm, that's sort of a joke, but I, but um, intellectual property being taken, there's, there's some things that need to be worked out in research as we move forward. And that's, again, some of the things that um, I'm working on right now to sort of flip the script in that so that there'd be more engagement with community. Uh, can everybody hear me? I uh, I had a question regarding like the nutritional aspect and um, when the USDA said okay to subsistence foods, did they create like a food pyramid for the subsistence foods or like what, how did they say yes to that? Because I know there was probably a whole gambit of things <laughs> to, for them to say, yes, we're going to provide this and this is why it's nutritional and we're going to say how these things meet our guidelines. Does anybody speak to that? Well, I know <laughs> that there are, you know, when they first came to me with this idea of the study, I was like, of course, we know our foods are nutritional you know, already. So we don't really need to do a study on that. And I didn't see the kind of the broader idea of, of all of this, especially when it comes to other uh, tribes in Inuit Nunat, like Canada, Greenland, those guys who sell beluga in the store, or, you know, they can, they can access their foods, not just like, like with commerce, rather than even just, you know, in a setting like a school or, or a federal state-funded program so um but 
there, there has been, um, I don't know about this project in general or, you know, this project specifically, but in general, there have been, um, lots of nutritional, um, uh, information, um, that like, like I access a book that was made for cancer patients and it has page upon page of, you know, everything that we consume and the nutritional value and especially what it mostly has, like with seal meat, it would be iron. And, um, but interestingly enough, our area, we don't, we don't sow, we, we just reap, like we just gather. So it's just out there and we gather. Um, so, and we don't have, uh, the tundra is not a good place to, and the growing season is so short that we don't have a lot of greens. It's, uh, mostly in, you know, the, the proteins that we have and even the fats, the seal oil is, um, um, we eat it with everything. And yeah, so I think, I don't know about this particular study, but, uh, there are, there are some good information, uh, nutritional information, things out there, resources out there somewhere. Well, I think Shauna had her hand up and then Claire. Great. Um, many thanks to each of you for a fantastic collection of presentations on this research. It's fantastic work. Um, I, I'm, I'm really curious to something that you touched on briefly just now, and that's the, the idea of connecting with um, other communities potentially in, um, in Nunavut, so Inuit communities in Nunavut that are facing similar issues and that may be able to come up with potential frameworks for um, integrating or assessing these ideas about subsistence um, living and, and how that can potentially be integrated with culturally informed care. Is that something that you can tell me a little bit more about the potential for that? Yeah, Canada is gold standard for, um, at this point for research and, and also culture, um, kind of like being able to uh, regain their cultural ways and stand in them. And a lot of that, I think argumentably, um, the elders would tell you that it's because they retain their language. Um, I was recently in Nunavut um, at Baffin Island and I went to Kaluit and Pan Inlet to study. So this is one of the things that's coming out of that is um, culture sharing um, experiences. So like a team of Alaskans went out to Baffin and we looked at a hunter program that has been successful in, in Nunavut for the people. And it really is a traditional hunting program where uh, the government pays for hunters to go out and hunt and provide foods for their community. And um, it's, I mean, we do that naturally here and we do have like very small programs that allow for buying of gas or or um, like ammunition or something like that. But being able to actually have a program where a village would have a, a building, boats, trucks, hired people, like multiple hired people that I think when I was in Pond, they had two or three people hired hunters to go out and, and hunt the foods that, that their people needed. And so um, so I think it's now just beginning that we're looking at all of the different culture sharing things that that everyone's doing. And they were interested in us because we were more subsistence minded and pra in practice than they were. And so they were happy about that. We were like all jealous about that. They speak their language and we don't. But uh, but yeah, hopefully that answers some of that. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for these presentations. They were so awesome. I guess I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like the impacts of climate change on subsistence and kind of if there's any, like how much of an impact that's had and if there's any plans to like, or how you're grappling with that, like moving forward of the potential impact on climate change, like when you're trying to create these like long lasting programs. Lucas, you're unmuted. Are you going to answer this one? I was just going to ask you if I could drop some of Cassidy's stuff in the chat to answer that one. Karina has oh, yeah. a daughter who does of a lot course. of speaking about this. Yes, she is uh, a young <laughs> Native leader that uh, travels all around um, to talk about climate change and all of that. Um, 
so Lucas is going to drop something in the chat, like a link, but, and so I, I'll just talk about it. Um, absolutely an issue here. Um, things like, um, that we haven't even studied yet, um, the, the richness of our salmon and me as a, uh, subsistence preparer of foods, noticing that within the last eight to 10 years, the salmon have, it used to be that I could cut like 50 fish and maybe one would have like this weird pus pocket of something that we didn't know what it was. And it was like real warmy and whatever. And we just toss it in the ocean. Well, now there it's, I can't get through 10 fish without finding two or three. And so now we're thinking, is it safe to eat? Uh, what is it? You know, we don't know as people who prepare foods and that includes um, our seal meat. And I think I've just seen and shared uh, something about um, walrus meat and the uh, microplastics that are being found within the muscles of the walrus meat and, and all of these different things that are happening now um, it to, with our animals that we rely on. And so there, I think it, it absolutely affects us. Um, our ice is just so weird. Um, even in Cassidy's young age, my daughter, she's like 20, I don't know, 27 or something. And she's no, 24, sorry. <laughs> I have five kids, it's hard to keep track. But, um, you know, she has noticed in her young short life as a hunter, um, the difference in the ice and the changes that we're having to adjust to constantly because of the rapid um, deterioration of our, of our uh, coastline here. Well, we are, I think, four minutes past our, our timing here, but I really wanted to yeah. thank our speakers. Um, Chantia, you were the one who spearheaded this, so we really, really appreciate you putting um, such a great panel together. Um, we have recorded this, so we're also more than happy to share the recording with you all in case you want to rewatch or there's something you missed. Um, but but thank you all for for joining us this evening, um, and thank you especially to to our speakers today. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye.